back to the Worth Your Time podcast. I'm your host, Erica, and I'm talking today with fellow podcaster, much bigger podcaster than myself, Hunter Vilas. Thank you so much for joining me, Hunter. Oh my goodness. It's so fun to be on the other side of the microphone. I'll just try not to start asking you questions. <laughs> well, I have to say Journey Women was one of the very first podcasts that I discovered way back. I don't know, must have been five years ago or so. Is that yeah. how long it's been? Yeah. Right. And so when I first started listening to podcasts, my very first one I listened to was Jamie Ivy. And so yeah, as I was too. sort of I need more. I need more. Yours is one of the ones that I found. And so I've sort of been a, a listener from a distance for a very long time. Oh, and cool. I just thought, you know, this is the great thing about having a podcast is you can just invite someone on to talk with you. And I was exactly. like, I should invite Hunter on. So, so great. Jamie was my introduction to podcasting as well. Oh, which really? Was really? Really fun. And I used to listen to her while I was walking the streets of Fort Hood, Texas, when Brooks and I were first married. And that was actually how I got introduced to podcasts in general and interested in and creating one myself. Well, honestly, I probably heard her mention your podcast and that's probably where I heard it too. I yeah. think she was the, uh, the Genesis for many people probably. Yeah. She's great. I'm really she grateful. For her. Well, let me just, let's get to it. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your family and all those things. Yeah. So I am Hunter Belis. Um, I have three kiddos and I'm married to a wonderful guy named Brooks. We have been married for 10 years, which feels like, oh, we finally have a little bit of time under our belt. And yet there's so much we could learn and so many things uh, that we have before us, God willing. Um, but we have loved doing life together. He was in the military for eight years. And so a lot of our life was moving at the bidding of the U.S. Army and we just recently transitioned to civilian life about two years ago, and we are living in the first location that we do not have a move out date already on the calendar. So this is a new season for us, um, hoping to plant our roots down a little more deeply here in Northwest Arkansas. Okay. Okay. I didn't realize he was out of the, the military now, but that's, that's good. I'm sure a little bit of a relief for you ha having three kids. That's rough. That's a lot yeah. <laughs> um, for your husband to be gone, but that's, that's awesome. Well, let's talk about, we started talking about the podcast stuff, but let's go back to it a little bit. How did it get started? How did you decide that you wanted to do this and just put it into motion? Yeah. So you know, when Brooks and I were in the military, I say we, it was yeah. really him. I it's say we, though, because <laughs> yeah, I mean, my whole entire life revolved around everything that we were doing in the military. Uh, we were stationed at Fort Hood in Texas, and I found myself so discombobulated. I did not expect to be a military spouse. I thought I was going to do an entirely different thing with my life. I had a job that required me to work opposite hours of pretty much everyone else. So when I was available, no one else was. And I started plugging in my headphones and just walking the streets of Fort Hood, Texas and listening to podcasts. And I listened to Jamie's podcast. I would listen to John Piper's podcast. And I would think, man, if I could just marry like this conversational tone with kind of the rich theology that I'm like hearing from John Piper in the solid joys podcast or whatever it was at the time, desiring God, probably then that would be my dream. And there wasn't anything out there back then that I had access to. And so my husband just encouraged me. He's like, he bought me a Yeti microphone for my birthday one year. And he was like, you should create this podcast. And simultaneously I was interfacing with like a lot of women on post, which is our way of saying like where we lived, like mm -hmm. a, a military base. Um, and we would be, you know, hanging out on the playground and our kids would be playing together and we might start to have some spiritual conversation, or maybe I would share the gospel and see someone come to faith in Christ. But due to the transiency of the military, they might move within two weeks or two months. And so, you know, the time frame that we were dealing with in which I could encourage them to get plugged into a local church and to really teach them how to study the word of God, it was just really limited. And then when they got to a new duty station, I was like, man, I don't know if they're going to have a confidence to walk into a church or any of that. And so, um, I really saw it as, an, uh, it as an opportunity to get into the earbuds of women that I was doing in-person ministry with, and then potentially to encourage them to look to the word of God for answers to the questions that they had, and then to plug into the local church. And I didn't really have like a grandiose vision for journey women at the time, other than like, hopefully these, these conversations will encourage them to get into their Bibles and then to step foot into a local church. 
Um, and then when it launched, it was really interesting to see just how many women were hungry for those kind of edifying conversations. Um, and then journey women just continued and we eventually developed a mission statement that says, you know, uh, journey women's designed to, um, encourage women to know and love God and his word to invest deeply in their local churches and to go out on mission for the glory of God. And it's been such a joy to see, um, how many journey women there are all over the world. Um, and just to get to be used by God in that capacity, but the primary recipient of encouragement really has been me. And now I look back on all those years of transiency in the military. And I think, man, you know, I really personally had had a host of mentors in my life. And then due to the nature of moving every 18 months, we moved seven times in 10 years. Um, it's hard to establish those connections with women in your local context when you're not, there for very long. And so the, the Lord really used the podcast as such a means of grace to me, um, to be able to have people still speaking truth into my life. And for me to be able to ask like the hard questions that I was personally processing as a journey woman. Uh, so it's just been such a gift. Now, were you connected with a lot of, I know you've had a lot of guests on over the years. Um, but did you sort of start from scratch there or did you have connections with people already to ask on as guests? If you go back to the early episodes of journey women, you will realize this is just Hunter talking to her friends. <laughs> so <laughs> It was really amazing though, because, um, through that process, I became friends with other podcasters mm. and back in the day, there just weren't as many podcasts out there. So, uh, Laura and Emily, uh, of the risen motherhood podcast were two of my early friends in podcasting. And they were so formative in shaping kind of the vision for journey women and really, um, creating conversations that were gospel centered. Um, I don't think that was a vision that I had until I talked to Laura and I think she was like episode 12. Um, so yeah, it was really just God's grace that I was able to talk to anybody. I mean, some of the earlier episodes, I believe I talked to Jamie within the first 30 episodes or something like that. And it was just really incredible to me that they were willing to join me, but I think it was also just the nature of there being a lot fewer podcasts. Mm -hmm on yeah. market back then. And now people are a little bit more inundated with podcast requests, no <laughs> doubt. Um, but that's awesome that you got in there. I actually, I did listen to Risen Motherhood earlier today. So I'm totally tracking with you there. And I have awesome. had Laura on this podcast as well. Oh, um, so great. I love what they're doing. I love what you're doing. Um, how do you decide who you want to have on and what you want to talk about? I know you do a lot of theological stuff, maybe mm -hmm. some apologetics. Um, what's the decision process like for how you plan out what's going to mm -hmm. happen next? Well, since the inception of journey women, it's really, the process has been the same. It's like, well, what topic do I think would be helpful for the listener? And I'm thinking pretty narcissistically. I'm like, what's going to be helpful for me. Maybe it'll be <laughs> helpful for the listener too. And then who do I know that could speak to that? Well, and so that's why you look back and you see, oh, it's Hunter's friends from college and things like that in the original episodes. And then now the circle has just expanded and expanded and expanded, um, to, okay, like we're going to talk about, oh, I don't even know God's providence recently. And we were able to have an excerpt from John Piper reading his book on journey women, because it's like, well, nobody does it better than Piper when it comes to John, to God's providence. So, mm -hmm. um, that's really the way that it's worked. Um, and now we're in to a season, a seasonal approach for journey women. So we're thinking about, we just thought like, you know, how much are people really taking from one-off episodes? You know, would it be more beneficial to be talking about a particular topic for a longer duration of time so that maybe it could just sink into their brains, um, a little bit more. And so, you know, we just kind of sit down and hammer out topics that are going to go into that series and then hammer out guests and then reach out and do the best we can with landing guests that we feel like will be able to speak well to whatever topic we're hoping to address. Who have been, can you say a couple of been your favorite interviews? Oh, you know, some of the interviews that I've done that were my favorite interviews were just so surprising. Um, I think about Dr. Ligon Duncan. He is, I don't know all of, um, Ligon Duncan's official titles, but I know he's like the president of reform theological seminary. I was super intimidated to talk to him. I think he's a chancellor. Um, and he's really smart. 
<laughs> yeah. By the end of that conversation, Dr. Duncan and I were crying together. I mean, it was just such a rich conversation. It's just so wonderful to be able to gather, um, you know, via the internet with people who just really genuinely love the Lord and who have spent a lot of time thinking and studying who he is so that then they can help people like myself who are just really eager to grow, eager to learn. Um, so his comes to mind, um, Johnny Erickson Tata, hers Mm -hmm. also comes to mind. Um, if you don't know Johnny, she suffered from an injury when she was like around college age. Now she's, um, a quadriplegic can't remember technically, but she is paralyzed. And I was only able to talk to her for 30 minutes because her vocal stamina is so impacted to this day Mm -hmm. by the injury that she suffered from. And at the end, she just started to sing. And if you know, Johnny, she's always talking about singing her way through suffering. And Mm -hmm. I just sat there and wept thinking about her sitting on the other end of the microphone, um, singing. So there's been some real moments for me that have just been, I'm like, I can't believe that, that, that got to happen. Of course, I always love talking to Jen Wilkin. Um, she's just so smart and she, um, really encourages me, um, to develop and grow theologically. So, um, for sure there's more, but those are a few that come to mind. That's great. Okay. I have to go back and listen to that Johnny Erickson Tata episode oh, because you know it's weird. Up. It's funny. She's one of the few, even growing up, I, she had written books years ago and she's just one of those people that stands out in my mind growing up, even as a kid hearing her story. And I always remembered it. And she's like, she's still around and she's still yeah. doing what she did and having such a strong witness um, everywhere she goes. So that would have been a really good one. Um, Okay. So you talked about, you know, you wanted the John Piper, but also the conversational tone in the podcast. I don't know if this is true. You can tell me what you think. I feel like there's been a tipping towards understanding theology more lately, especially with women. I know for myself, uh, it's been over the past two or three years where I just sort of went, wow, I've been in church my whole life, but Mm -hmm. no one's ever explained all these really important things to me. And, you know, I'm one of those people that just sort of accepted things and, you know, here I am and I have a strong faith. Not everyone's necessarily going to be in that same boat. Um, are you seeing that too? And and what do you think about it? Yeah, I definitely think I, I have seen that and I'm really encouraged by that. And I don't know if it's that there are more resources that women are having access to, or just that we're realizing some of the foundations on which we've stood may be really shaky. And Mm. so it may be a desire to establish and stand upon a really strong foundation. And I think if anything, over the last couple of years, we've seen shaky foundations are not going to do like in this current context. um, If we have cracks in the foundation, we need to go back and address those. And so I'm really grateful that women are um, thinking through these things and that they're prioritizing really studying and knowing who God is, uh, because it impacts everything that we do. It impacts our entire lives. And, you know, Tozer, he has this wonderful quote that I'm sure everybody's heard. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Um, and I think it's important for us to realize that whether we are actively thinking about theology or not, we all have thoughts about God and we all have this understanding about who he is that drives the way we go about our lives. So it's worth our consideration. He is worthy of our consideration uh, Mm -hmm. because it's not just going to have eternal implications, but it's going to impact our daily lives as well. Yeah. I love that quote. I definitely have heard that one before and it's such Mm -hmm. a good one. Well, I, that's, you know, one of the reasons I do like your podcast so much is because you are diving into some of those deeper issues. And it's been really helpful for me as I've been I mean, I have been eating up all the apologetics books lately. And so it's just kind of like what I'm passionate about right now. So it's been really great to kind of go through some of those um, series that you've had with different people. Um, I want to switch topics a little bit, talk about being a mom that is big in my life and many of the listeners lives here. Um, I have two kids that are three and six, so we probably have some similarities in our daily life. How old are you again? So I have a two-year-old that'll be three next week. And then I have a five-year-old and a seven-year-old who will be eight in November. So it's kind of- Okay. Okay. Uh, So this is, this kind of a big question to just launch into, but uh, I'll just (laughs) go for it. Um, 
how would you say that your relationship with God changed or has changed since becoming a mom? Did anything change or, or how do you view that now? Man, I felt like everything changed. I am kind of one of those people though, that just, I constantly feel like things are changing. I'm always thinking about change because I feel like I've endured so much of it. But when I became a mom, there was a really distinct shift for me because up until that point, it had actually been, as if you can't tell, I'm a pretty type a like driven personality. So it really wasn't too challenging for me uh, to orchestrate my day in a way where I could go about the spiritual disciplines that I desired to engage with in order to grow spiritually. And it just, you know, I think that can lend itself to a little bit of self-reliance, unfortunately. Um, but when I became a mom, I recognized my need for God in a way that I had not formerly. I saw parts of myself that I had never seen before. I never knew I was an angry person. <laughs> <laughs> I relate so much. <laughs> like I never thought I had an anger issue until um, becoming a mother. So when something like what happened this morning and my two-year-old woke at 5, 11 a.m., not to be specific. Um, <laughs> I was tumbling. awake too with mine, so don't worry. <laughs> Yep. Yep. Came tumbling down the stairs. And then I realized that he had been disobedient and turned on his sister's light and woken the whole family. Oh, no. not just That's me. the worst. And then I, you know, react poorly. It's just this opportunity for me to see how much I desperately need, not only my children's forgiveness for failing to respond gently, kindly, to offer instruction like wisely, but instead to react like rashly and out of anger and self protection and, and just selfishness, a desire for sleep, yeah. <laughs> a desire to be able to get up and read my Bible. Now I'm really seeing like, man, this is just how much I need God's grace. And this is also how much I need, um, the Holy spirit, the spirit in me and the truth of God's word to help me tenaciously fight my sin. Um, so I think that my kids have really been, uh, such an opportunity for me to acknowledge my need for God's grace. And I'm really grateful for that. Yeah. I mean, I think it was just the other day I was end of the day and, you know, I had yelled yet again, like too much. And I, it just kind of felt like, you know, the whole, I keep doing the thing I don't want to do. And yet mm -hmm. I was able to be reminded that, Hmm. his mercies are new every morning hmm. and thank God for that. Right. And, hmm. and then I can remind my kids of that too, when I apologize to them, which I do frequently <laughs> and just say, Hey, you know, mommy messes up too. And Jesus forgives me just like Jesus can forgive you. And you really get the opportunity. I mean, to look at it on a positive light, you get the opportunity to model like God's grace and like the gospel to them just in you living it out in that way. Totally. So I, I totally agree. It's like, things are out of your control in a way that you, you have never experienced before. So it is, it is hard and it is a constant struggle, but that's why we keep getting to go back to God and ask <laughs> for his help. Um, so I was reading one of your posts. Um, and I think you were talking about your book, which we're going to talk about in just a minute, but, um, teaching your little kids to love the Bible. That is, doesn't feel to be an easy task so far. <laughs> you know, I have about six kids Bibles, right? And for whatever <laughs> reason, my son who loves to read books, he's six. Whenever I'm like, let's read one of these Bibles. He's like, no, you know, and I'm like, oh, yeah, why? but you don't want to push it. And so how are you teaching your kids to love the word, even though they're very young and it's hard to sort of get them excited about it? Maybe. Yeah, totally. I, I know this feels like such a challenging task. And I think oftentimes we want to overcomplicate it, but I really think it is so simple. And sometimes we're looking for this perfect formula to try and engage our particular kids. Um, but I think the primary way that we're going to teach them to love the Bible is by loving it ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, think about the things that you love. What, whatever it is like a hobby or for me right here, I've got this cup of frothy coffee that I'm chugging down while we're talking. How did I know about frothy coffee? I knew about it because my sister told me about frothy coffee and she said, Hey, 
you should try this. This is great. And then she gave me a cup of it and I drank it. And then she didn't just do that, but she told me exactly what frother to buy and exactly what milks to use in order to like achieve premium frothy coffee status. And <laughs> You know what I do now? I drink frothy coffee every day because it's true. It's so good. And I think passing down a love for God's word is kind of like that. Um, it's something that we can tend to overcomplicate and try to approach from like, here's how we're going to teach our kids. But I think we have to first start with ourselves and ask ourselves, are we loving God's word? Are we prioritizing time in God's word? Do our kids see us? really genuinely loving God's word, seeking to live by God's word. And I think that can be such a help to us as mothers too, because often we think that when we're interrupted in the middle of our quiet time, that it's such an inconvenience and that now we're not going to be able to accomplish what we need to accomplish in the word in order to rightly understand it and then live in light of its truth. <laughs> but what if it's not so much about having this perfect manicured response or reaction to every question that we receive about theology? What if it's just more about a humble posture and a dependence um, just in, in our children and in our family seeing mama needs God's word and she's regularly coming to it, even if it isn't something that, you know, we're able to, to do in the way, exactly in the way in which we want, but isn't that just true of everything in motherhood, you know? So there's that saying that, you know, things are best caught, not taught. Mm -hmm. And I really think that the best thing that you can do in order to instill a love for the Bible within your kids is to really love it yourself and to let them see you love it. Yeah. That's such a great point. We, somebody said something to me a couple of years ago. Um, I was doing a read through the Bible in a year, the Bible recap on my phone every day. And my friend was like, you know, I always use my physical Bible because I want them to see yeah. it because I could be doing anything on my phone. You know, you could be looking at Instagram. They don't know the difference. And so I have never forgotten that. And so now our Bibles are always out. Um, and my husband and I, you know, we read, we try to read a chapter a day and then talk about it at night, which is very hard to do sometimes, but, um, but they do see us reading it all the time and our Bibles are everywhere. Yeah. And so that mentality of more is caught than taught Yeah, that sticks in my head every single day. And I'm like, even if you don't even talk about it with them today, like it's still there, it's still yeah. permeating your home and it yeah. matters. And they're going to remember those things. Yes, I completely so, agree. Okay. Let's talk about your children's book. I have been, I was starting to tell you this earlier. I have just been on a whole thing with Christian children's books because I was like, every time I go to Barnes and Noble and the library, I mean, it's like, there's like these stories and they're about values, but they're not connected to like biblical truth at all. Yeah. Like I've even seen, we accidentally bought a book one time that was like, it was like, he's got the whole world in his hands, but it was like, they changed the words to we've got the whole world in our hands. And I was like, no, we can't have this book. Like <laughs> this is not <laughs> <in> it. burn pile. <laughs> yeah. We cannot be reading this. So I'm like, I don't want any of these books in our house. So anyway, I have sort of gone on a, uh, like been buying books yeah. like crazy. So your, yours will be next, but tell us about it and how it happened. Well, I got to send you a copy, but you know, <laughs> it really was birthed out of, um, just a delight in God's word. And I had the opportunity. My husband was so kind to give me like an hour to just sit in my room by myself. <laughs> and I just started thinking about how much I love God's word. And I started writing it down. And if you follow me on Instagram or anything, I just sometimes when I'm trying to process something or express something, it comes out in a poem. And so it came out in a poem. And then I thought, you know, I was, I was really thinking of us, Erica, I was thinking about how much I want kids to know and love God's word and how much I want, not just kids, but families to know and love God's word and how much I want them to employ what I call is like a Deuteronomy six approach to talking about the word. Um, if you read Deuteronomy six, it talks about loving the Lord, your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then it talks about uh, teaching the commands of God to our children. And it talks about doing that when you sit, when you rise, when you walk by the way, like it's just all the time, basically. So like, how can we, how could we give 
families a vision, not just for a family Devo, but for a life that's really revolving around the word of God. And so I sat down, wrote this book. Um, and then, yeah, that the rest is history. I mean, I took it to a publisher and actually it was the same publisher that, um, had approached me long ago about potentially writing a book for parents on how to memorize God's word with their children. And that's because I do a ton of that on Instagram. We just accidentally started sharing about scripture memory stuff. And then it just kind of stuck because people wanted to do that, but didn't really know how. And so as I was thinking though, about writing a book for parents on scripture memory, I just thought about us. And I thought, we don't have time to read a book <laughs> yeah. about how to do another thing. Cause we're not even doing the things we know we ought to do. Right. And I only have time for one book and then I have time for a bunch of kids books, which is what you're talking about. And so for me, um, I thought what better way to kind of cast this Deuteronomy six kind of vision for knowing and loving the Bible, uh, together as families than to do that in a way where we can read it, uh, all day, whenever we want, because it's something that we don't just enjoy, but also that the kids enjoy and, and by God's grace, it's like sticky and memorable because it's a rhyme. And I just hope that it will help families develop a robust understanding of why we need to memorize scripture and why we need to be intaking scripture regularly and that it will kind of bolster um, their desire to do that because they see, oh man, this is going to help us fight sin. Oh man, we treasure God's word because Jesus is in it. Like it's not just this thing to check off our spiritual to-do list. It's really this is part of the life of a Christian. Mm -hmm. That sounds like exactly what I need uh, because that's sort of, <laughs> um, that's sort of like the thing that's on my agenda this year with the kids is to start doing scripture memory. Um, I had told my son, oh, when I was a kid, I did this thing like the Bible bowl, <laughs> you know, type of thing. And That's awesome. he, he was, he was like, uh, is there, can I, I want to do that. You know, he's just Aww. anything competition, you know? Um, but I think you're right. And I think for me growing up, like I kind of alluded to earlier, um, learning the Bible wasn't necessarily emphasized as the most important thing. And I think that is what a lot of the generation that moves away from God, like college twenties. And obviously we're seeing, you know, this sort of post-Christian stuff that's happening. I think some of it has to do with that lack of biblical knowledge and, and lack mm -hmm. of understanding of what's in the Bible, the foundation of our faith yeah. really. Um, and so I think I'm really glad I'm seeing sort of a resurgence of interest in that. And it is maybe more important than almost anything else right now. So I think you yeah. you're very timely with that. Uh, well, I'm really excited for families to get a hold of it and I'll definitely send you a copy. So you have to send oh, me. Thank you. I will hundred <laughs> percent be ready to read it. Um, okay. Quick, quick switch of topics. Um, one, one thing I'm very passionate about is the local church and, and also the church as a whole. And, um, so my, I have a book coming out this year as well, um, oh. about the church and women in the church. And so I always like oh. to ask people, um, about their experiences with the local church, but you were very interesting to me specifically because I know that you've moved around a lot. Yeah. And one focus I have is people that are getting back to church or wanting to switch churches. And so that dilemma of how do you find the right place to go? How do you know it's the right place? And so how have you navigated that um, the many times that you've moved? Mm -hmm. You know, I think word of mouth has been so huge for me with the military. You already kind of have this military community that you can access and reference, but certainly, you know, if you're thinking about switching churches, you're going to have access to other believers in the city. And I would think about what believers do I know, um, that live life as a family, uh, with their local church congregation and, then just start asking them questions. I'd be asking questions about what's your teaching like on a Sunday morning? Um, do you teach through the text? Are you just mainly sitting underneath like topical sermons or are, is your pastor willing to address passages that may not be super popular or pleasing to the ear? Um, I'd be asking questions about, do you hear the gospel preached regularly? Are you regularly hearing about Christ, his life, death, resurrection, and how that impacts, you know, your understanding of every passage that you read in scripture and your daily life. Um, 
I'd be thinking about what it looks like for that community to do life together under the word of God. Um, and I'd be thinking a lot less Erica about the programming that that church has to offer. I'd be thinking a lot more about the priority that that church places on the word. And I think that is a mistake that our generation in particular, especially if you're in a context where there are a lot of churches, um, we want to look for which church is going to give us the best kids programming, which church is going to, you know, offer to us the best women's Bible study with childcare. (laughs) (laughs) And you need to be thinking about, uh, which church is living life together under the authority of the word of God with a shared confession. And how are we going to do life together in such a way um, that these families can be coming alongside us as we're parenting our children and seeking to teach them the truths of scripture um, and seeking to proclaim to them the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so that's going to take away a lot of the other things where you're worrying about whether children's programming or all of these things look like, because they're going to be living life together with other families who are also oriented um, around the word of God and who are regularly going to be looking for opportunities to invest in a discipleship capacity in your life and in your kids' lives too. I think those are some awesome recommendations. I think those are really helpful. Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. Um, Okay. So the last thing I always like to ask people is what have you been reading? What can you recommend? Podcasts, books, anything? Have you had time for that? Oh, you know, there's some of us, Erica, and I, I think you're one of these people just based on what you've said thus far. You know, you have to take yourself out of this category if you're not the person who reaches for a book for fun even when you don't have kids. <laughs> if you have kids and you had reached for books for fun for years, then you're going to continue to reach for books for fun, you know? And I always feel a little bit like I want to offer a disclaimer to people who are following me that they just weren't readers to begin with. I'm like, you know what? It's okay. (laughs) Like there's grace. I was the accelerated reading champion of my elementary school, not to brag. (laughs) So (laughs) I love to read. I'm always reading multiple books at a time. That's my favorite part about my job. Um, You know, right now I'm geeking out on the life of Amy Carmichael for a project Mm. that I'm working on. And I've read almost every biography that I could get my hands on, on Amy. And I'm also reading a lot of her original works. And that's just been a real delight. Um, I'm reading Mountain Breezes right now, which is her poetry volume. And she just really uh, inspires me. I think about her life differently now as a mother, thinking about the number of children that she rescued or that were rescued, you know, out of slavery and like a human trafficking situation. Mm. Um, and thinking about the many, many children that she mothered. And so she's just been a real inspiration to me. So mountain breezes, all her bag, a a chance to die by Elizabeth Elliot. I read revisited that one lately. It's just all so good. Um, but you know, a lot of my reading right now happens with my kids, um, because of their ages and because we're homeschooling. And so we just picked up a little pilgrim's progress. Have you done that one yet? A little Mm-mm. progress Mm-mm. by Helen Taylor. Oh my goodness. I cannot recommend it highly enough. It was illustrated, um, by Joe Sutfin, I think is how you pronounce it. I'm not sure, but he, I believe he illustrated Andrew Peterson's books. And so there's these wonderful illustrations of these bunnies who are, you know, on, their spiritual journey, um, Mm. just like the Pilgrim's Progress book. And so it's been really cool to engage our kids with spiritual conversations about, you know, what it looks like to live life as a Christian. Oh, that's such a great idea. You know, that's the second time I've heard someone mention Pilgrim's Progress today. So I feel like it must be a sign. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. It's a particularly good version for kids that are younger. My kids are obviously five and seven, like I said. And so the pictures really help them stay engaged and it was a family favorite for sure. All right. Well, thank you, Hunter, so much. Stay on with me for just a second after this, but I appreciate your time and it was so great to hear from you. Thank you so much. Oh, absolutely.